And so blood pressure, I sometimes tell people, is not truly a disease. You know, yeah, it has an ICD-10 code, but it's a marker that there's something wrong in your environment that's affecting your arteries. And by the way, ICD-10 code yeah. is, is yeah, what physicians like a billing use code. for, for yeah. billing, you know, yeah. when we put blood work together. Right. So, yeah, so and that's also, yeah. A quick sidebar on that is that like a lot of times when I'm doing these kind of heart attack prevention workups in people, they don't have diseases. So there's not billing codes for it. So that's why this isn't as, you know, practiced by everybody because you don't know how to quote code for this. Like endothelial health doesn't have an ICD-10 code. Wow. Prior to this podcast, Mike and I pounded some element. Very funny. Um, you want to make sure that you don't inhale it because the intranasal form of element, which is the powder electrolyte drink that we take, is not advisable. Check out element. <laughs> Mix it with water or tea. Drink it. Do not put it in your nose or get it in your nose. It contains 1,000 milligrams of sodium, 200 milligrams of potassium, 60 milligrams of magnesium. Great for eliminating headaches, muscle cramps, fatigue. Again, you think that you are really tired. Maybe you are. Maybe you're just dehydrated. We want to rehydrate with an electrolyte solution because we don't just get rid of water. We get rid of electrolytes. Really, really great if you're headed to train. Again, we're talking about cardiovascular function. You do need to remain hydrated. Love this product. Go to drinkelement.com slash Dr. Lion. You will get a free sample pack. That's eight single serving packets free with any element order. Um, also, if you don't like it, you can give it away. They'll give you your money back. Phenomenal product. I use it all the time. That's drinklmnt.com slash Dr. Lion. Dr. Mike Twyman, thank you so much for coming in studio today. We have been friends for quite some time. Actually, a thank you to Bedris Koulian, who introduced us. You are a board-certified cardiologist, fellowship trained, no less, former Navy, which I won't hold against you, yeah. <laughs> and a fine, fine cardiologist. In fact, you are the cardiologist who consults for the Institute for Muscle-Centric Medicine. You are the head cardiologist in the institute that I am building and also within my practice, you have your own practice, Apollo Cardiology, which I'll put all that stuff below. But one of the reasons why I really appreciate you so much is the way you integrate and you interface traditional cardiology, which is very disease focused, with preventative cardiology. And people are all ages, that listen to this podcast. And I'm sure some of you youngins are thinking, well, I don't really care about heart health. <laughs> Shame on you. Uh, because really heart disease starts, what? In your teens, 20s. That's outrageous. Yeah. And at any given point in time, uh, heart disease is what? The number one killer? Still number one killer, men and women. And we wait till later till someone has their first heart attack or I don't know, the first time we do a lipid screening, which arguably is not enough. And, and we'll talk about that. That's you know certainly just blood work. But before we get into all that, tell me about yourself. Well, thank you for the opportunity to speak to your audience. I mean, heart disease prevention is my passion right now. And you know, back in 2012, I was finishing up my cardiovascular training at St. Louis University. And Almost thought I was going to be an interventional cardiologist and be fixing the people in the middle of the night having heart attacks. And that's all rewarding, but I really got interested in the prevention side of things, saying, like, well, how can we get to these people 10, 20 years ahead of that so that we don't end up in the cath lab at 3 a.m. in the morning having to put stents in people, which stents are great when you're having a heart attack, but stents don't reduce your risk of having heart attacks. They don't reduce your risk of dying mm -hmm. unless you're actively having a heart attack. So there's something more, and it's just getting missed. You know, I know we're going to talk about statins. Stands are great tools for certain individuals, but if they were all magical, we wouldn't be having heart attacks. And there's over 700,000 Americans that have a heart attack every year. We're missing a lot of people. 700,000 people that have heart attacks. Correct. Do we know what age, typically? Is there an average age? The average age for most men is going to be in their uh, mid-60s, but unfortunately, the the scary thing is that half the people who have heart attacks have no symptoms before they have that heart attack. So most fatal heart attacks actually happen in younger people in their 40s and 50s. <sighs> and they had no warning. Really? Right. No warning? All the, blood levels are normal? 
they may have some abnormal labs, but they would have had no symptoms. They wouldn't have had chest pain with exercise or shortness of breath with exercise. They had. They might have even passed a stress test. Well, I know we'll talk about stress tests in just you know a little bit, but there's other tests that people can do to tell them where their risk is. And so, once I got out of my training, I just did a deep dive into you know what are the different tests that can look at cardiovascular disease, what are the different biomarkers that can look at cardiovascular disease. And then later fell down the rabbit hole of the biohacking world and figured out which, how Which I did notice yes. your glasses. Yes, my glasses. And for the listener who cannot see Dr. Twyman, he has uh, orange? Yellowish blue blocking glasses. Oh, These see. are the day ones. Okay. They, they block, if you're really nerds, uh, blocks up to 465 nanometers. So it's blocking some what of the blue light. What is yeah. that? Yeah, so. Blue light. Uh, blue light. You know, the high intensity blue light from our devices affects your sleep. That's the best way to think about it. But it's... Uh, but that's just a sidebar. But uh, but the biohacking world, you know, is very much into you know optimizing their health and optimizing mitochondria. And mitochondria are extremely important for our health and longevity. In your musculoskeletal world, you know, skeletal muscle is rich in mitochondria. Well, the heart's a muscle. It's just different cardiac muscle, and a third of the heart is mitochondria. So I kind of bridge those worlds of you know preventive cardiology and biohacking. And said, okay, well, how do we make your mitochondria work efficiently? If you can make your heart work efficiently, mitochondria, mm. then everything else starts working better. You know, was there, it's an interesting path. Um, and typically when someone goes through medical school and medical training, they are trained in algorithms, trained in execution, which you were as well, but you didn't have a traditional path. You went in internal medicine, which all cardiologists need to be trained in internal medicine first. Then you went to the Navy. That's How true. did that go? So I had the uh, the Navy paid for my medical school training at St. Louis University. So I did three years of internal medicine, get a broad base knowledge of you know all diseases. Other did you than like surgical. that? Was that miserable? It was really challenging. <laughs> it was actually my least favorite rotation in medical school. <laughs> but same, I knew, same. But I, but I knew that I ultimately would have liked to be a cardiologist if I you know could get into the training. So I did the three years and then did four years active duty in the Navy. I was at, stationed at Beaufort, South Carolina. As an internist, I was mostly taking care of the Marine recruits at Paris Island, so putting back together and shipping back out to their training, or I was also taking care of the retirees in the area that uh, um, are from Hilton Head or Savannah and would come up to the hospital. Hmm. Did you like that? I liked it a lot. Did you tell them to stop faking it? Stop. Yeah. Oh, what yeah. is it, a quinjury, a oh, quitting yeah. injury, faking the injury? Oh, we had a lot of those. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of people wanted to go home to their moms. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I mean, yeah. listen, probably better cooking, a lot better nutrition than on base, uh, but whatever. Spent four years there. Then, so you repaid your dues in the Navy Correct. and then went, went back, back home to, to, to St. Louis. Yeah, back home to St. Louis, went back to St. Louis University, did three more years of cardiovascular training. And so it's, it's again, broad-based training and, you know, inpatient care, taking care of patients with heart attacks, atrial fibrillation, heart failure. Then outpatient care is mostly focused on, you know, blood pressure, lipids, and then a lot of imaging. So I'm board certified in echocardiography, uh, still... Uh, keeping that certification up. Just took that board certification last week after awesome. studying for Sign 60 me up. hours. Sign me up. <laughs> right? Yeah, so <laughs> still can read ultrasounds pretty well. Did a lot of nuclear stress tests and then also was an uh, invasive cardiologist for many years. So I was in the cath lab doing procedures where we would thread catheters up into the heart and take pictures of the heart arteries and tell them how much blockages they had. And you know, by the time you have a blockage in your artery, that's been going on for quite a while. Mm. You know, one of the things that I think is so impressive about you and is why I trust you, I trust you with my patients, uh, also my family members, is because you're so well-trained. And right now in the space, there's a lot of confusion as it relates to cardiovascular health. Part of the reason is I think that we have to set the stage for the actual amount of training a cardiologist has to do, which is tremendous. You're talking, yeah. <laughs> you're talking about three years of the internal medicine, and then you're talking about additional cardiology training fellowship and also the time in the arena, the time spent in the cath lab taking care of patients. You pivoted at some point, you realized you didn't want to be in the cath lab. You realized that by the time you're catching these heart, uh, heart attacks, cardiovascular disease is too late. Endothelial dysfunction, which I know that you're a big uh, champion of, of really kind of protecting the endothelial, which you'll explain what that is. Did you have a defining moment? Was there one moment where you were like, oh, gosh, I, I need to switch this up. 
wasn't an exact defining moment from a cardiovascular standpoint, but I had a family member who had some real significant issues with gluten insensitivity. And, you know, in our training, you don't get a whole lot of nutrition training. And this person was seeing a functional medicine provider said, like, why don't you try a gluten-free diet? And this was back in 2012 or so. And this person's like, arthritis and brain fog start getting better. And I was like, I didn't know that gluten caused all these problems. And then, you know, stumbled upon, you know, the quote paleo diet at that point, started just playing around with it myself and noticing like, okay, well, you know, I feel a bit better with this. And so I realized this whole different world existed other than just treating symptoms. And so after I got out of my cardiovascular training, went out and did some training with IFM and A4M and just, you know, had my mind blown that there's this whole different world of, you know, looking at how all the systems put together. I mean, you know, as you know, in medicine, a lot of times you're just in a big silo and you only were focusing on the disease that you were trained in. So, you know, somebody had some GI issues and you're a cardiologist like, well, go see your GI doctor. You know, I don't, I don't manage that. But, mm-hmm. you know, if you don't have stomach acid, it's like we were talking about before this, that's going to be a problem. You can't make enzymes effectively. And if you can't make enzymes effectively, you can't make nitric oxide effectively, which we'll talk about. So you realize that all the pieces are together. And so, at that point, I said, like, well, I have to do it differently. Like, so take all this great training I've had as a, you know, invasive cardiologist. You know, my goal is don't let people go that far down the pathway and back them up 10 to 20 years. Okay, let's start there. 10 to 20 years early, what should people do? The top handful of take home, do this today if you do not want to drop dead of a heart attack. What do they need to do? If we want to do that first, and then we'll talk about the, the testing part. But like, I want to talk about all of yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. But I know that people are like, yeah. oh man, another yeah. science podcast yeah. from yeah. Dr. G. Yeah, I, no I won't go that deep. Yeah, this, this will be tactical. So I mean, the tactical things yeah. are, you know, your circadian biology trumps all, and I tell people that. That's the reason I'm wearing these glasses. And really? Have, yeah, it does. And do, what is circadian? Circa- what is so circa- your 24 biology? hour cycles? You know, how do you make your hormones and neurotransmitters are based off the light cycles, and also the timing your nutrients come in. So this is why I teach every single one of my patients is that you have to get this right. First. First, you know, definitely we talk about exercise and nutrition with my patients, but if you don't get your light cycles right, all that other stuff's probably not going to get optimized. So an optimal day is you get up, you go outside and see the sunrise. You know, if people follow me on Instagram, I'm usually posting my sunrise every single day wherever I'm at. That sunrise has the right color of light that hits certain receptors in your eyes to tell your brain what time of day it is. You have a master clock behind your eyes called the supercosmetic nucleus. Don't worry about the name of it, but it's like your master clock that gets set by the sunlight that hits your eyes. That then tells your body how to make hormones and neurotransmitters throughout the day. Then when you're in as a as a cardiologist, the first thing that you tell patients, if you were to say, okay, he, these are the things that you are going to do to protect you from having a heart attack down the road. Correct. Yeah, they want to know about their lipids and blood pressure. I'm like, we're going to get to that. Those are extremely important. Okay. But if you do not get your circadian rhythms right, everything else is not going to go optimal. So see the sunrise. It's that important. Then when you're inside, block as much artificial light, especially at night, that you can because the artificial light affects cortisol. You know, when you're in front of a lot of blue light from screens or overhead lights, that light tells your brain it's still noontime. And that's fine. Right now we're talking it's about physically noon. But if it's 9 p.m. at night and you're staring at your screen, well, you'll keep your cortisol up because your body's supposed to be alert when it's daytime. And your melatonin stays suppressed. It's kind of like a seesaw. Melatonin is that hormone of darkness. And you need melatonin not only to go to sleep, but to stay asleep. And melatonin is like the major fuel that replenishes the mitochondria at night. And we you know, talk about mitochondria making energy for you. If you don't have healthy mitochondria, the heart isn't going to do well. So heart failure in part is due to having dysfunctional mitochondria. How do you program mitochondria? It's your light environments. And then the nutrition side of things, which I know we'll talk more about too, it's really important about the timing of your meals. And I know this is controversial, you know, like what do you, know, you what do? Is that, what do you what do? I personally do? I mostly just do, you know, time restriction throughout the day. So I don't eat until the sun rises. So usually within half an hour to an hour of the sun rising. And very rarely do I eat past five thirty, six o'clock at night. So and usually the, feet, the sun sets yeah, for you? Most or? of the time. But I mean in the summertime, you know, the sun's setting six, you know, or eight o'clock at night or so. So I'm usually done before that. But the simplest way to think about it is like only eat when the light's out. When the sun is out, you can eat from my standpoint. But I'm not really tight on my feeding windows per se. It's usually a 12 hour feeding window, but it's pretty tight in that I don't eat three to four hours before bed because that just really helps your sleep optimization. It lets your metabolism start, you know, kind of slowing down and getting your body ready for sleep. So timing of meals for me is like more critical than almost anything else. And then we get into the macronutrients and I definitely espouse your philosophy of, you know, how to get optimal protein. I, I would, protein. Keep, I would yeah. kick you yeah, off the you, podcast right, if you yes. didn't, I'm kidding. Yeah, but we didn't I'm, talk I'm about I'm totally protein. kidding. Yes. Yeah, so we definitely talk about protein with every single patient. They're always like, how much protein is that? I'm like, 
it's a deck of cards. Like you can do this. Like they're always so surprised that like I'm recommending this much protein. Like you guys aren't even near your optimal yet. But um, but the timing of the meals is extremely important for your circadian biology too, because your liver and gut they have their own clocks and they get programmed by the time that the nutrient sensing is coming in, and they're going to wait three to four hours before they say, oh, no more deliveries are coming in tonight, and then they switch into kind of repair mode. So circadian rhythms trump all. And then. And then, then we start talking about endothelial health, nitric oxide. So the endothelium is your inner lining of your arteries. It's one cell thick, and it coats your entire arteries. You have around 60,000 miles of blood vessels. 60,000 miles of blood vessels? A lot of blood vessels. And that's why back to the cath lab days, you know, know, we're placing stents in 10, 30-millimeter sections of the artery. Well, you didn't treat the other 59,000 miles of arteries, you know, atherosclerosis or hardening of the arteries is a systemic process that's all over. So if you have it in one spot, it's going to be in your other artery beds. It's going to be in your brain. It's going to be in your carotid artery. It's going to be in your aorta. It's going to be in the arteries that feed your sexual organs. So obviously that's one thing that some guys, that's how they present to cardiologists, that they come in with erectile dysfunction complaints. Yeah, if you have issues there, you likely have issues in your heart arteries as well. But it all starts with the endothelium, and that's 60,000 miles. The endothelium is one cell thick. If you're able to peel out all your endothelium, it would be the surface area of six tennis courts. So it's one of your largest secretory organs. And it's sort of like a protective, semi-permeable barrier for what floats in the lumen where the blood is from what gets into the walls of the artery. So certain things are supposed to be able to pass, but you don't necessarily want certain lipoproteins to get through that wall frequently. And what would be an example of the lipoproteins? The ApoB containing particles. So ApoB. ApoB. Yeah. And so we're, gonna... we're gonna talk about LDL and all that good stuff uh-huh. coming up. Okay. But think of the endothelium as supposed to be like a protective coating. And one of the major things it does is it releases a gas called nitric oxide, which they won the Nobel Prize for in 1998 for discovering this. So nitric oxide is a gas that causes the muscle in the artery to relax. So that improves blood flow. That improves blood pressure. But nitric oxide also has like Teflon, for those that still remember Teflon, or nonstick surface. So when you have healthy nitric oxide levels, whatever's floating through your blood does not stick to your arteries. So the white blood cells don't stick to the arteries. The lipoproteins don't stick to the arteries. When the endothelium gets impaired or damaged, think of like scratches in the coating. When that scratches happen, things start sticking there, sticks there like Velcro. And that's the first sign that you're going to develop atherosclerosis is endothelial dysfunction. And that can happen decades before the plaques actually start building up in the arteries. First Form has two products I absolutely love for cardiovascular health. Number one, the obvious, which is fish oil. First Form's full mega, which is an omega-3 fish oil, should be, you know, really on everyone's regimen. That's full mega, omega-3 fish oil should be on everyone's regimen. You can go to firstform.com slash Dr. Lion, free U.S. shipping. You know how much I love this. You know how much I love this company, and I believe in them. Everybody, everybody should be on a fish oil. Second, I love Whole Heart. They have a cardiovascular health formula. You can go to firstform.com slash Dr. Lion, and this is a cardiovascular formula which supports heart health. It has olive leaf, it has resveratrol, a little bit of potassium, chromium, great formula. Check it out. Let me know what you think. Again, that's firstform.com slash Dr. Line. What do people do? How can people help the health? So number one, we have circadian rhythm entrainment, light and food timing from a cardiologist. Yeah. Number three, essentially, or number two, we can bunch those first two together, is endothelial function. And the endothelium is that um, coating between the actual blood vessel where the blood comes and the the layer, that interfacing layer. Is that correct? correct. You are saying that this is almost a way in which people can think of this is like a, a Teflon pan. And as that gets more use or uh, an inability to repair, it gets sticky, it can get cracked, there's all kinds of things that happen to it. This issue starts decades before an individual has a heart attack or has an issue. What can the listener do to address that? So first it's a test don't guess philosophy is you don't know if you have healthy endothelium unless you go looking for it. You know, some signs that you potentially have 
bad endothelium would be that you have high blood pressure. If you have high blood pressure. How high? I know that there's a lot of That's a discussion. good question. Yeah. 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 What is an optimal blood pressure is a good story too. You know, optimal is going to be less than 120 over 80, you know, millimeters of mercury. Um, now, it's a little bit differently if you're on medications to get down there, you know, should you be pushing people that low. But, you know, risk starts increasing when your blood pressure is about 110 over 70. So, if Which is much higher, which is much lower than people typically think about. Correct. And so blood pressure, I sometimes tell people, is not truly a disease. You know, yeah, it has an ICD-10 code, but it's a marker that there's something wrong in your environment that's affecting your arteries. And by the way, ICD-10 code yeah. is, is yeah, what like physicians use for, for yeah. billing, you know, yeah. when we put blood work together. Right. So, yeah. So, and that's also, you know, a quick sidebar on that is that, like, a lot of times when I'm doing these kind of heart attack prevention workups in people, they don't have diseases. So, there's not billing codes for it. So, that's why this isn't as, you know, practiced by everybody because you don't know how to, quote, code for this, like, endothelial health doesn't have an ICD-10 code. Wow. So you have to just kind of focus on what's best for the patient, not necessarily what's best for charting. Right, so, of course, of course. But, but back to the high blood pressure story, you know, high blood pressure is a sign that there's something wrong with the way the arteries are relaxing, and nitric oxide can be part of that story. So if you have high blood pressure, you probably have endothelial dysfunction. And yeah. above, would you say that that is the first indicator? Would you say it's above... 120 over 80, would you say they have dysfunction or that's still okay and you're creeping 130 to 140? It's, a, it's hard to know. I don't have an exact mm. cutout, but if you're consistently greater than 140 over 90, it's probably pretty consistent. You do have endothelial dysfunction. You know, we talked earlier, if, if you're a man and you have erectile dysfunction, you already, by definition, have endothelial dysfunction. So Does it matter I, the age? Not generally. And, you know, um, you know, I can't remember the exact numbers on top of my head, but like I think it's somewhere like 20 to 30% of 40 year old men have issues at times with erectile mm -hmm. dysfunction. By the time you're 60, it's like over half the people. So I sometimes will tell people like ED equals ED. So erectile dysfunction equals endothelial dysfunction and vice versa. So if you fix the nitric oxide story, then erectile dysfunction can get better. That's have the whole have story. you found that to get better? For sure. And that's why the, you know, the medications like Viagra work. You know, Viagra helps the body keep nitric oxide around longer so the arteries stay dilated longer. It doesn't fix why the nitric oxide was low or why your systems aren't making enough nitric oxide. It just keeps it around longer. And so they initially were studying you know, those type of medications for hypertension and pulmonary hypertension, and they realized that the happy benefit that it helped with yeah. erectile performance. So they kind of pivoted, and that's became a blockbuster drug. But, you know, those are kind of the clinical signs, but there are testing that you can do that will look at the health of the endothelium, and we do that in our office. You know, one thing you can do is there's a salivary nitric oxide strip. It looks like litmus paper. You put saliva on it, and depending on the color, determines essentially how much nitric oxide your body could produce. I think I did that a few years ago, two years yeah. ago. If I think your levels were good, if I remember right. <laughs> I think you beat Shane. Yeah, so, probably uh, cares if, yeah, you know, you're yeah. not first or last. Right. Then, you know, there's a device called the Max Pulse. Uh, it's a pulse wave velocity test. It kind of looks like a pulse oximeter that everybody's probably used to put on their finger to measure their heart rate and their oxygen saturation. But this device looks at the elasticity of the arteries. So your arteries should be very compliant, and they should be like, you know, when the blood leaves your heart and goes down to the blood vessels, they should expand and contract. So and is that the, that thing that you put me on? And it was that, that was the Endopad. The Endopad. Yeah, so yeah. that was different. That's a little bit different, but they're similar technologies. So the Max Pulse is measuring essentially how fast the arteries expand and contract. And so the arteries should be like a little accordion. They and snap back. Can anyone out. have access to this, or it's really it's through a physician only? Um, more likely it's going to be at a physician's office, but there are some consumer-facing devices that are starting to try to look at that. Um, I brought, I think I have another room, the, the watch that you know, reports to be able to do that. I'm excited. We have yeah. lots of yeah. uh, show and tells. <laughs> lots of show and tells for you guys. Yeah. So, it's like bring your cardiologist right. to work day. Yeah, bring yeah. bring your health optimizer to work day. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah we're going to go through all that for everybody. But the device uh, that uh, you were speaking of that we have in the office too is called an Endopat, and that measures the uh, measurement of something called the reactive hyperemia index, so RHI. The, it's oh, the, what was it? The o. RHI. RHI, yeah. the reactive. It's the reactive hyperemia index. Hyperemia Basically, index. Okay. Essentially, it's a stress test for your arteries and tells it how much can your arteries dilate when there's stress on them. So it's a 15-minute test. where you have And these it little, feels like it's at yeah, least 45 yeah. minutes. Yeah, and somebody has to talk you through it usually because I tell people, like, your arm's going to go to sleep and you're going to get this pins and needles sensation and your arm's not going to fall Wait, off. when Dr. Mike is saying your arms go to sleep, what he really means is he's going to completely restrict the blood flow on your upper extremities. Yes, it's the blood flow restriction uh, training. And so. <laughs> the that uncomfortable feeling where you know people where your arm has fallen asleep, your arm will be narcoleptic. Yes, 
Yeah. Yes. We know. And then Terrible. at that point, you basically you temporarily cut the flow to that arm. Mm-hmm. The other arm acts as a control, and then you're using a blood pressure cuff to do this. So your blood pressure cuff is pumped up over your systolic blood pressure. So then when you open up the, the stopcock and the blood rushes back in, that's when your body will have reactive hyperemia. So the blood rushes back into the artery, that gel coat, that endothelial glycocalyx, that senses that flow of blood coming back. Which is a very big word for... The endothelial glycocalyx is you know, something that sits on top of the endothelium. It's like a gel coat. That senses how much blood is coming back, and it transduces that signal to the endothelium below. So it's kind of like seagrass sitting on the bed of a river, just sensing what's floating through the lumen. When it sees that huge slug of blood coming back, it's like, whoa, here it comes. It tells the endothelium below, release nitric oxide, and then the artery dilates, and the blood rushes back in. And you measure well, how much does that artery dilate. That's what that reactive hyperemia number gives you. So your artery should at least essentially double in size to say you have a normal stress response. Optimal would be three to four X. Most people don't even double in size. So then by definition, they have endothelial dysfunction. There's things that are potentially causing that endothelial dysfunction, which you can look into by their lifestyle, you know, what they're eating, are they smoking? You know, hopefully nobody's still smoking, but you know, people vape and that can mess up your endothelial function. I know a few people that still smoke. I'm not going to say their name, but if you're listening to this podcast, I told you so. Um, I, I want to stop you for a second because what you're pointing out, I want everyone to be aware of. We haven't even touched on blood work yet. And we're talking about endothelial health as a critical role in the protection of your heart. And blood work is is critical. And we are definitely going to go through blood work as critical, as a cornerstone and there are other tests as a comprehensive approach. You're talking about the uh, endopat, the other, what was the other one? Oh, max pulse or pulse wave velocity <laughs> testing. <laughs> yes, the, the pulse wave velocity testing. Uh, I'm sure you're going to talk about a CIMT, which is a carotid intimal thickness scan. Um, yeah, are there more? Yeah, so those are the major kind of endothelial function tests. So. I think of atherosclerosis as, you know, what's going on in that 60,000 miles? First thing is the endothelium gets impaired. So do some testing that looks at, well, how healthy is the endothelium Is there right blood now? work in addition to those? There's some blood work that you can kind of infer that there may be an issue with it. And I can touch upon it by now. So the kind of the poor man's one would be just the old school urine, myocreobium to creatinine ratio. So we've all checked that for patients who are diabetic. You know, if you have high protein in your urine, it means the arteries to the kidneys are being damaged. But if you're damaging the arteries to the kidneys, that's a good marker that there's endothelial dysfunction to the kidneys. You have it there, you likely have it in your heart. So you have protein in the urine, possibly there's something going on with your heart arteries. But the other test that I always will check is, you know, a test called ADMA, asymmetric dimethylarginine. This is a long word, but if you have high levels of ADMA, it suppresses nitric oxide. And why would someone have high levels of ADMA? Genetic or lifestyle? High levels of oxidized LDL, so their lipids are oxidizing or rusting, can have an effect on that. Proton pump inhibitors can have an effect on that. Proton pump inhibitors, yeah, meaning yeah, the, Pepsid, yeah, um, like Prilosec, Prilosec. Maxim, the you know the little purple pills, the you know those are really good. You know if you have an ulcer or H pylori, but which know, people think are benign. And you know in, in my clinic, we always, unless someone has an active ulcer or absolutely needs. A PPI, which is the proton pump inhibitor, what Dr. Mike is saying is that it can contribute to heart disease and endothelial dysfunction. Correct. I mean, you know, PPIs are great for when you have an acute issue, but, you know, think of them as they should be on for a few weeks. And then when you put out mm-hmm. the issue, you got to get off these things because otherwise you're affecting their body's ability to digest proteins and make enzymes. And if you don't have enzymes, things don't go well. Right. Um, so the other blood test that we would look at would be homocysteine. Uric acid. Um, Can you briefly describe uh, both of those for the listener? Sure. So uric acid is a compound that's normally filtered out of your kidney. And you know, traditionally in medicine, we look at it as a marker of, you know, what is your risk of gout, which is this painful crystal arthritis. Um, you know, people, you know, usually classically get it in their big toe. And, and no, it's not just red meat that causes it. Uh, and that's, that's a, not the, the issue at all. It's more the issue that the body isn't breaking down, you know, uh, fructose, mainly from fruit, or the person's drinking more alcohol than they let on. It's one so, way, yeah. I hate to give up the secret, but it's one way I tell if a patient is lying to me about their diet, if their uric acid is really high. 
Yeah. I mean, it's a marker, too, of just that, you know, their metabolic flexibility. If they have high uric acid, something's off. Mm -hmm. um, and uric acid will deplete an enzyme that affects nitric oxide. Homocysteine is an amino acid that, you know, can contribute to arterial calcifications. Uh, some people have a genetic issue where they don't methylate that homocysteine into methionine, which is inactive and doesn't damage the arteries. But and that's MT MTHFR for the, the listener. Yeah, the, the which... nerds. The, it's going to be the six seven seven one more than yeah. the twelve ninety eight one. And, but... and you know, in um, at WashU, we always used to test homocysteine for a vascular risk factor for individuals for vascular dementia and vascular disease. Yeah, and because of the nitric easy. oxide, yeah, it's cheap. And it's mm. easy to actually bring down homocysteine. Right, you just gotta go looking for it. I, mean, I just saw somebody the other day who's had high blood pressure for years, their homocysteine was 22. Oh, I was like, see, that's this is why, very high. I was like, this is why you have high blood pressure. You're yeah. not, you know, medication deficient, you have high homocysteine, we gotta I fix that. that. Individuals are not medication deficient. Right. Circadian rhythm regulation, sun, Sunlight. Impacts. Yeah. Sun affects endothelial function by the UVA light hitting your skin and liberating nitric oxide. So there's apps that can help determine that for your local environment. So I tend to use an app called DMinder Pro or what Circadian app. D Minder Pro, D like the vitamin Minder D. Pro. So, yeah. Oh, vitamin D. People should, what you're saying is people should get that morning sunlight because that morning sunlight is different. It preconditions the skin for when UV light. Preconditions the skin. Yeah. So if you don't want to burn and you don't want to get wrinkles, you need to get enough red and infrared in the morning time so that the UV doesn't cause the issues. It's the UVA that causes the wrinkles. And oh. blue light, too. Blue light causes more wrinkles than... What? Yeah. So people staring at their computers for eight hours a day have more wrinkles. Will sunscreen help that? Possibly. They're actually making sunscreen for people to wear indoors in front of computers. Uh, sign me up. Sign, no, I don't, I don't want any wrinkles. Are you serious? Yeah. I've, I'm, I'm learning so much. Basically, don't use my computer, otherwise I'm going to get wrinkles. Go out early, get my specific light wave to precondition my skin. Correct. How long do I have to stay outside for? Depends on what the um, disease that you're trying to mitigate, but if it's just more primary prevention type stuff, usually I recommend people get at least 20, 30 minutes of morning sun to kind of set the clock for the day and then take intermittent sun break. So instead of taking a smoke break, you go outside for a couple of minutes, you know, intermittently throughout the day. So that light information hits your eyes, hits your skin and tells your body, oh, it's noontime. This is the hormone and neurotransmitters you should be making at noontime. And then in your world, you know, exercise. This is probably one of the major benefits for exercise from a cardiovascular standpoint is that when you exercise, you got to improve blood flow to the muscles so the muscles can, you know, get oxygen, nutrients, and get rid of waste products. Well, all that blood flow rushing back in, it's kind of like that endopad test we talked about earlier. You're going to have that blood transduced to the endothelium, how much flow is coming in, and the body then releases nitric oxide. So exercise is improving nitric oxide. Any kind of exercise? Anything but that increases any, blood. Yeah, increases blood flow to, through the muscles. Yeah, so cardio, you know, resistance definitely would have an effect on it. Um, and then, you know, nutritionally, it's going to be more the kind of the dark leafy greens and the beets because of the nitrates and nitrites that are in them. This is a pathway that, you know, after the age of 40, you become more dependent on the salivary pathway to make nitric oxide than making nitric oxide just in the artery walls. So as people age, there's an enzyme called endothelial nitric oxide synthase, or ENOS. It doesn't work as well. So in your arteries, there's L-arginine. And so there's a lot of companies that make L-arginine supplements. It's not that you're necessarily deficient in L-arginine. It's your enzyme doesn't convert that L-arginine to L-citrulline mm -hmm. that effectively. And during that process, nitric oxide gets kicked off. So after the age of 40, you start becoming more dependent on this pathway through your saliva. So when you eat your dark greens and your beets. If you eat them. If you eat them. Or you I eat like the, beets. Yeah, I actually like yeah. beets. Or if you eat the animals that ate them and you're somehow <laughs> getting those nitrates into your system, there's bacteria in your saliva that are called nitrate reducing bacteria. They will break that nitrates down into nitrites. You swallow it in your saliva, it goes into your stomach. And then if you have healthy acid in your stomach, there will be an enzymatic conversion over to nitric oxide. So if you use mouthwashes that destroy all the good bacteria in your saliva, you can't make that conversion happen. If you're so on, I knew it. Yeah. Bad breath kills people. Bad breath kills people. Yeah. If you use Listerine, because I know a lot of people do, that actually affects the systemic NO2 production. Correct. It can affect your blood pressure. Nobody should be. So what you're saying, if I'm hearing you right, is nobody should be using Listerine. Not long term, probably not. Whoa. Okay. This is great. These are great take home tips for everybody. Don't use Listerine. Have the bad breath. Just go to the dentist. Deep yeah. clean. 
um, get out, get the early sun, 20, 30 minutes, increase dark leafy greens. What if someone doesn't like, could they use a green powder? Could they use a beet? You know, I use red powders all the time. Um, and do we even know the dosage of beets or how much beets would someone have to eat to increase NO2? That's exactly right. It's sometimes very challenging to say, are you getting enough from your diet? So um, Dr. Nathan Bryant uh, has a lot of research on this, and they actually assessed different um, vegetables from like five different areas in the States. And depending on the soil conditions, determines right. how much nitrates are in them. So they're gonna be like a five-fold difference. Right. So that's why you can say like, well, just eat you know, one beet three times a week and you're getting in the dose. It's, you had to get like 300 to 400 milligrams of nitrates in a dose. And how do you know that? Nobody would know that, you know? So the way to know would be test your, you know, salivary nitric oxide strips, test your blood pressure. If those are normal, then you're probably getting enough. But if it's not, maybe For you're not. For a period of time. Correct. Because it seems, you know, the body is so resilient over a period of time. It's, again, these things take a decade to show up. It's possible you're deficient, but you're able to deal with it because you still have uh, the capacity to make L-arginine or to make the enzymes necessary. What else in terms of, so we talked about um, don't use mouthwash, obviously the sun, uh, red beets, for NO2 production, dark leafy greens, what else do you recommend? The exercise. Yep. Supplements, yep. are there any other supplements for NO2? There are, there's a couple of proprietary ones that can help with uh, that salivary pathway. When they dissolve in the saliva, they'll release nitric oxide gas, and then they will also help couple that enzyme back so that the body can make L-arginine convert over to L-citrulline again, so your body relearns how to do that effectively. Could they, could they just take L-citrulline? Obviously, it wouldn't be getting to the root cause, but they can take L-arginine. Because there's a recycling pathway mm -hmm. with L-citrulline because oral L-arginine isn't all that well uh, absorbed. So L-citrulline can, and then sometimes we'll convert back into L-arginine. So some people can get by doing L-citrulline, but the dose off the top of my head, I can't remember exactly what L-citrulline's dose is. So again, it's one of those test don't guess. Like if L-citrulline works for you, great. But if it doesn't, you got to keep going upstream to figure out what's broken. Okay. What next? So we've got heart attack prevention, endothelial function, um, so you want to talk about it, atherosclerosis and imaging? I do. Imaging? I do. Yeah. I want to talk about all of it because cardiology right now I think is one of the most misunderstood um, fields. Don't you think? I mean, we're seeing so many people weigh in on cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, ApoB, lean mass hyperresponders, eat a bunch of saturated fat, reduce your cholesterol. And none of them, are, or, or most of them, are not cardiologists. And I, I think that it really confuses the space. Would you? Would I you think agree? so because I think the majority of cardiologists, you know, their heads are down in the trenches taking care of really, really sick people. They don't have time to weigh in and you know say, hey, okay, this is what I think on lean mass hyperresponders. And you know, most cardiologists don't even know what that term would mean. You know, they're just like, you have high cholesterol. Here's your statin. They wouldn't dive deeper than that. They just don't have time to. Um, but. You know, it's really about more about the arterial health than it is, you know, what's floating in your blood. So, you know, the lean mass hyperresponders is an interesting, you know, phenotype that you can see. So these are the people that are eating, you know, very low carbohydrate diets, depending on what, you know, uh, data you look at. Maybe it's less than 50 grams a day um, who have an issue where then their LDL cholesterol, which is a, you know, 1970s technology. I mean, there's better ways to look at your, quote, cholesterol, which we'll look at in a minute, but they'll look at their LDLC will be increased, their triglycerides. When you say increased, how for I think the they're lean I think their cutoff is, I think they actually have 200 milligrams per deciliter they consider as abnormal. And a normal person walking around probably has a level under 150. So it'd be rare that you'd have a resting level over 200 unless you had FH, familial hyperlipidemia, or you're one of these individuals who, you know, goes to a keto diet or lean mass hyperresponder type of um, dietary plan, and you get this really high LDLC over 200 milligrams per deciliter, and you'll continue to have normal HDLC. Generally, I think they say they, you know, it's going to be at least 70, and the triglycerides are going to be under 80. So they do not look like they're an insulin resistant individual. Mm. So, you know, they will typically on the internet then say like, well, my LDLC is high. And then I've gone to get this calcium score test that says I don't have any plaque in my arteries. I can continue to do this diet. And I just tell them, like, you are still kind of playing with fire because you really don't know what's going on with your endothelial health. 
And you don't like to see individuals having an LDLC above 200. It really depends. I mean, because there are people that can have healthy endothelium, they have no plaque in their arteries, and they have those type of levels. Because a cholesterol panel really just tells you at one moment in time what is in your blood. It doesn't tell you where that cholesterol goes. Cholesterol is a molecule that, you know, is so critically important. Without it, you're not alive. You know, you make your hormones with it, your sex hormones, you make your vitamin D, your bile acids, you make the shells of your cell with cholesterol. So cholesterol is a critical molecule. Without it, you're dead. But cholesterol is this waxy compound, so it will not float in your liquid blood. So the body has to make something called a lipoprotein. So a lipid and a protein get together. And I tell patients in my office, I show them a tennis ball. You know, it's spherical. So your liver makes these little spherical particles, these lipoproteins, and inside, the cholesterol goes inside. The triglycerides, which are energy for the cells, your muscles, goes inside. The fat-soluble vitamins, A, D, E, K, go inside. And then different phospholipids, which are building blocks for the cell, all go inside these lipoproteins. Again, they're like little cargo ships. The liver makes them, sends them into the blood vessels, and ships them out. That lipoprotein carrying energy is going to your muscles. So like, here, here's some energy for the muscles. The muscles put out a little receptor and get it out of the bloodstream. Now, if that happens and just goes into your muscles and it uses what it needs, and then the muscle sends it back to the liver and gets out of circulation, that's how you know evolution put us together. But if the endothelium has been damaged and these lipoproteins then stick there because that Teflon surface is broken, then the lipoprotein, which is carrying the cholesterol, which is supposed to be going to some other cell to help make hormones or whatever, now it gets trapped in the artery and it's like illegally docking its cargo into the artery wall. So there's no such thing as good cholesterol. There's no such thing as bad cholesterol. The body just has cholesterol. There's different things that transport the cholesterol around, different lipoproteins. But if you're going to say there's a, quote, bad cholesterol, it's only going to be the cholesterol that's building up in your artery walls. You're not supposed to have this cholesterol deposit in the artery wall because that will, you know, that's pathognomonic for atherosclerosis being developed. You know, you have to have cholesterol in the artery to have atherosclerosis. So back to the story of the lipoproteins, you know, if you just do a blood test, you just say, okay, this is what's in that person's blood at this time. You have no idea where that lipoprotein ended up. Hmm. What would, how would someone get a better picture? So they have the blood work, they understand that this is one spot in time, that you're looking at a traditional, so you're looking at a traditional cholesterol panel and other things as right. well. Correct. And when you look at other things, can you share kind of what those are, even what's in a traditional cholesterol panel that everyone is looking at, and then the next level? Sure. So in a traditional lipid panel, you're going to have the total cholesterol, an LDL cholesterol, an HDL cholesterol, and a triglyceride. And sometimes the LDL cholesterol is not even actually directly measured. It's calculated from the Friedwall equation. So the way that they would measure these in the past was they would take your blood, They'd spin it down really, really hard, and they would look at the different fractions of what floated in there. And there's, you know, the low-density stuff is up at the top, and the high-density stuff went to the bottom. It's highly dense because there's a lot of protein inside of it. There's not a lot of fat. The high-fat particles were more on the top. And so that's the best technology they had at that point. The cholesterol is the cargo. So they, you know, spin your blood, and they just look at all the cargo. Okay, but you don't know, like, well, how many cargo ships were there taking all this cargo around? So that's where the advanced lipoprotein testing comes into. So you can look at the NMR testing, which looks at the LDL particle, the HDL particle. that's an NMR panel. Correct. And there's different lab companies that do that. Um, Or maybe even an easier way for people is just get an ApoB, an apolipoprotein B number. Very inexpensive test. It's about 90% correlative to what an LDL particle would be because most of your ApoB particles are going to be LDL particles. And explain what an ApoB particle is. Back to my analogy earlier of a tennis ball, the, the lipoprotein. On the outside of the tennis ball is that white stripe. On the t- That white stripe is that apolipoprotein B. The ApoBs are on the outside of the LDL particles. So the ApoB acts as a structural protein. It keeps the tennis ball in a sphere. And also acts like a lock and key so that when that ApoB finds a receptor that it fits into, it clicks and then gets downloaded into that cell. So the liver has to put out a receptor that gets these lipoproteins out of circulation. So, you know, get the cars off the highway. So the ApoB binds to this LDL receptor and gets it out of circulation. So you can measure well, how many ApoBs are. Those are the atherogenic particles. So 
It's kind of a shots on gold type of philosophy. The more ApoBs you got floating around in your bloodstream, well, maybe most of them are going to hopefully go to making, you know, vitamin D and testosterone. But some of them, if you have endothelial dysfunction, some of them are going to get stuck in your arteries. So it's, again, a shots on gold philosophy. More ApoBs, more chances some of them are going to get stuck in your artery wall. So that's the blood testing I would look at. And what numbers do you tolerate for people? When should people get treatment for lowering their ApoB? How low should it be? What is kind of the spectrum? Correct. Yeah. It's, and it is individual. And is it dietary related? So it sounds Partially like, dietary related. Yeah. Partially. Because, you know, if you're eating certain fats, your body's going to make more lipoproteins to shuttle that fat and cholesterol out to the cells. So your body's going to have some um, capacity to rise and lower based off your diet, but it's not all about diet. You know, you'll have a genetic set point no matter what you put into the system. And the body, you know, however we were put together through evolution or God or whatever you believe in, you know, if you, you know, have a coupled system where, you know, you're putting way more in through diet, the body will just produce less. Most of your cholesterol is made in your liver. I shouldn't say it that way, but because um, most of your cholesterol is actually made inside the cells, but your liver makes a good portion of your cholesterol. So if you're getting more through your diet, the liver just says, well, we don't need to make as much. So there's a, you know, always a feedback system for that, but there's not an exact ApoB number where I say everybody should be shooting for. It's going to depend on you know, how healthy the arteries are. You know, if you've already had an event, you've had a heart attack, a stroke, a stent, bypass surgery, you know, you want your ApoB as low as possible. And there's some data that maybe the ApoB should be down to like 40. That's going to take multiple I, I, agents. I don't actually think I've ever seen an ApoB. Only genetically have I ever seen somebody that low. I've never mm -hmm. seen anybody. And to get down that low with pharmacological agents, it's going to be high potency statin, a PCSK9 inhibitor, probably azetamide. You're hitting it from multiple angles at that mm -hmm. stage. But what for an average has, person. What if someone has healthy endothelium and a ApoB of 100 or more? Does, or do you see that if someone has an ApoB that's higher, they're going to have endothelial dysfunction or not necessarily? Not necessarily. Um, you know, again, like if you have really good Teflon coating, those ApoBs just slide right on through there. Um, so it's more, again, a numbers gradient for certain people, but, you know, all comers, I like to generally say it 90 or less, but if somebody can demonstrate that, you know, they have a healthy endothelial function testing, they have a healthy CIMT, which we'll talk about you know, a healthy calcium score test or a, the newer test, the clearly mm. CT scan. Yeah, let's talk about If you it. have those that are normal, then that ApoB really isn't that big of a concern for you. But if you have other issues, then we want that ApoB lower through whatever mechanism we can get it down then. A non-negotiable for understanding your cardiovascular risk factors include blood work. That's why InsideTracker.com slash Dr. Lyon has offered 20% off on your health and wellness testing. This includes all the cardiovascular risk factors and markers, many of which that we are talking about in today's episode. You have to do this at least once. Go to insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lyon and you'll get 20% off. What I love about this is you don't have to negotiate with your physician. You can just go ahead and order them. You can take it to your physician or your cardiologist to further take a deep dive into blood markers. So for a limited time only, 20% off the entire inside tracker store. Do it. Understand your risks. Do it at least once. We talked about endothelial dysfunction. Now we're really moving into atherosclerosis, which is the, how would you explain it in one word, the buildup in the arteries? Correct. Yeah. Hardening of the arteries. is what Hardening kind of, of the, the arteries. Yeah. Ways in which we can measure that in a blood level would be ApoB, or uh, would that would you say that that's accurate? It's a marker that you're at higher risk for atherosclerosis, okay. but it's not high ApoB doesn't automatically equal. But you will not develop atherosclerosis without an ApoB containing particle dropping its cholesterol payload into the artery wall. Got it. So they are linked, but they're not you know one for one correlation. But say you have abnormal endothelial function, what's up next? One of these ApoB-containing particles sticks to your artery like Velcro. It gets endothelium. It's kind of like leaky gut, which I hate that term, but the ApoBs get through the little cracks. It now gets into the layer called the intima. The intima is normally very thin, but if an ApoB-containing particle gets down there, the body then basically will sense that, hey, I'm being invaded by bacteria or viruses, and will mount 
immune response. So the monocytes come in. The monocytes are going to be kind of like Pac-Man gobbling up this stuff. Then it becomes a macrophage. Then it becomes a fatty streak. So this is a continuous process that if you don't stop it, you know, you're going to start developing more little plaques in the arteries. If you shut down the inflammatory process, the body can handle it, and the plaque will start shrinking down. But all this war is going on in the intima, which is the layer right behind the endothelium. There's a test called the carotid intimal medial thickness test, which can measure that thickness of the intima. And that's and the intima, the carotids are on the side located of your neck. on the side of your neck. Yeah. Um, they'll take an ultrasound. I know because I've had this done. Take an ultrasound, and it you know they it doesn't feel good, right? You you always anticipate it's going to be like a massage. How they're going to put like some gel on it, um, and then they look at the artery health, Correct. and they look at the the lining, and um, that's one way to look at. If there's any athlo, ath, atherosclerosis, okay. um, and is there a reason why they, is it just because the carotids are important or easy to get to? And Both, and, uh, yeah, that they're easily accessible mm -hmm. and it's a good window into what's going on in that 60,000 miles of blood vessels. So there's a pretty good correlation that, you know, if you have thickening intima or you're already developing soft or hard plaque in your carotid already on the side of your neck, pretty good correlation that something's going on in your coronary artery as well. So you got to look at the whole territory that you can. There's a lot of testing, you know, that you can look at. And if you see calcifications in arteries, kind of one of the weirdest one is, you know, the dentists do the panorex scans. And sometimes you'll see calcifications in the carotid artery on a panorex scan. If you see that. What's a, what's a panorex scan? It's the, the scan that they look at for your teeth. So the x-ray that, you know, they do when you're at the dentist, yeah. if you see calcium in your arteries on a, that scan. Will they tell you? I don't know if the dentists ever tell you. Some of the dentists are aware of it. But, you know, if you, you know, really are good at doing this kind of this root cause analysis is you'll ask the patients to upload any type of prior imaging they had. And then you just start looking at the, the story that if they say like, oh, that the aorta looks calcified in the abdominal aorta, you know, but no aneurysm, like, well, great. They don't have an aneurysm, but calcium is a marker that they have atherosclerosis and a large blood vessel. They got it there. They probably got it in their coronary arteries as well. So start going back upstream and looking it up there. But back to your carotid scan, you know, there's kind of two different ways to do it. You know, in traditional cardiology, we do a carotid duplex scan where you're looking at flow. You're looking at essentially for how much stenosis or blockages are in the artery. That's a late stage finding. It's still useful if you know if somebody puts a stethoscope on your neck and here's a brewery or turbulent flow. They want to know how much blockage is there. But the CMT using similar ultrasound technology. Um, to, to get the picture, they're not looking at flow per se, but they're going to measure that intima. And the more intima swelling there is, the more inflammation in the artery, the more likely you're going to be adding plaque to the system. It's kind of like the next step before the plaques build up. Hmm. That's important. And I would say, do, is that standard of care? Do most cardiologists do a CIMT? Most do not. Um, and it's not that they don't necessarily uh, know about the technology. It's just that it's one of the ones where you do have to have um, high degree of, you know, professional skill to be able to interpret the images. So you have to have the right software to be able to measure the thickness. And to make it reproducible, you should really use the exact same technology and the same scanning sonographer each time because there is some variability otherwise. So that's why it's not a, you know, standard care for everybody. It's a good test, but is it perfect? Absolutely not. There's some, you know, faults in it. So, you know, the, the test that you would then say like, well, if it's not exactly what's going on in the heart, you know, how do you look at the heart non-invasively? Well, classically, people do stress tests. And stress tests are really good if you have symptoms. Stress tests can be done one of two ways. They put you on a treadmill and they run you till you're tired, or they put an IV in and they give you chemicals to pick up your heart rate or dilate the blood vessels, and then they take pictures of the heart after peak exercise. So if you have symptoms, you have chest pain, pressure, shortness of breath, you can't exercise the way you used to think you could or, you know, just can't go up the stairs the way you used to. Well, an exercise stress test can help unmask that to see is it a cardiac source for that. So mm -hmm. put you on a treadmill, watch the EKG, and then often they'll take images of the heart either with an ultrasound probe or a nuclear medicine tracer and look at, okay, what did the heart do when it was under stress? Because that's going to unmask a severe blockage in one of your arteries. But one of the I don't want to say miss, but the fallacy is that, you know, if you pass a stress test, that you're necessarily low risk of a heart attack. That's not necessarily Which true. Which I think a lot of people think that right. way. Right. I mean, it tells you what your exercise capacity is and it tells you, you know, are your symptoms likely due to a blockage in your artery? But for the most part, you're not going to fail a stress test until you have like a 70% more blockage in one of the arteries. You got three arteries that sound on the outside of the heart. So if you have more minor blockages, you'll fly through a stress test, pass it, mm -hmm. but you have these little time bombs sitting on your arteries. And if they're 
you know, vulnerable, they're inflamed. Those are the ones that the people say, like, I had no warning that I was going to have this heart attack. Oh, God, those are the ones can, that rupture. Terrible. What? How can people check? What can people do in terms of other imaging? The other te- test that, you know, I've been doing since at least 2012 is the, the CT coronary calcium scan. It's a great test. It's kind of like a mammogram for the heart. You know, it's looking for actual plaque in the So arteries. now women get to do a mammogram and then a mammogram for the heart. Correct. Correct. They get both. But that's kind of a, a good analogy is that people are used to quote, preventative oncology, you know, you're going to get cancer screenings. Not everybody's used to thinking about, you know, cardiovascular screenings. They think like, well, I want to know what my cholesterol is. I want to know what my blood pressure what is. What age should people get the calcium score? Good, good question. And it does depend a little bit on family history. If you have a really strong family history where you've had family members in the 40s and 50s, sometimes they've done it as young as, you know, like 30 years old. But calcifications in the coronary arteries is, again, it's a little bit later finding. So, you know, having... It's kind of almost uh, kind of a matrix. Like, if, say, let's say an example, like a 40-year-old man. His score should be zero. If it's not zero, that person is super high risk in my mind. Now, somebody's 80 years old and the score is zero. Well, then whatever they've been doing for their life, it's working for them. It does not matter almost what their APOB is. It doesn't matter because Smoking, whatever they're drinking, doing. Those are the people yeah. that are like, I right. live to 125 right. yeah. and, and I believe that it was the one tequila at night correct. every night and that one cigarette. Yeah. Right. And that's the, the, not what we are saying. That's not for that. That's not for the average person. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So, you know, it is somewhat in the middle zone that, you know, if a 40 year old's calcium score is anything but zero, big problem. If you're 80 years old and your score is zero, cool. Whatever you did worked for you. But you're trying to find that intermediate risk person and try to reclassify them into either they need to be more aggressively managed because they're actually high risk. Or, you know, sometimes we both have these patients that, you know, their ApoBs or their traditional lipid panels, quote, high. And their doctor's saying, like, I really want you to start a statin. And maybe they're hesitant for whatever reason. They'll say, like, well, show me what your arteries are doing. You know, if their calcium score is zero, their risk of a heart attack is reported out to be like 0.4% over five years. But that's May- hard plaque. That's, right, that's hard plaque. hard plaque. So that's that is the caveat, and that is a very good uh, uh, pickup. Is that it's not zero percent. Now, why would your risk to be not zero? It's because of the soft plaque that's also present. The soft plaque hasn't yet calcified, and it's the soft plaque that's more likely to cause the events. The and do people attacks. feel that? People don't feel any they don't kind feel of plaque. It. They don't generally feel. You know, most people will not quote feel plaque until they have that seventy percent blockage in their arteries, because at rest they can get enough nutrients and oxygen past the obstruction. It's when they stress the body with exercise or emotional stress, which then, you know, raises adrenaline and cortisol in their arteries clamp down. So they should, you you know, I'm trying out this new technology, yeah. <laughs> the uh, Apollo. Yeah, the Apollo Neuro. Yeah, I think, yeah. It's supposed to lower my stress, but I don't actually use it for that. I'm, I'm using it to keep me awake because I, I unfortunately got only two hours of sleep. So if anyone is critical about the bags under my eyes, uh, try having two very little children. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, mm-hmm. Totally digress. You were talking about stress and the blockages, and and it just made me think about this this device that. So, so most people do I, you not. You know feel what the I feel like? Yeah. I feel like you know the not that I know exactly what this is, but the alarms when you go out of the house because this is can go in the ankle when you walk out of the house and. Yeah, you know, I usually like, wear it on the ankle. Yeah, the, the ankle like bracelet. Leash. Right. You're, you're leaving. <laughs> you're confined to the home. But anyway, mom jokes coming in hot. Um, the in terms of what if somebody had soft plaque, everything is normal. We have no idea. And, you know, in our, in our practice, we send people to clearly scan, which you and I collaborate in the same practice and also independently, but clearly scan. Can you talk about that? Because I believe everybody should do it. I think so. For all my CEO patients, uh, all of you that haven't done the test, which is 95% of you, I'm not gonna drop any names here, uh, I'm really tempted to. Uh, please go do that test. Let's talk about why. Sure. So the clearly test is a CCTA, a coronary CT angiogram. So in my prior days, I was an invasive cardiologist. We would feed tubes up the arteries in your wrist or your leg and take angiograms or pictures of your arteries. And is so, that is that contrast? Correct. So that's with contrast. So the CT angiogram is doing it non-invasively. It does require an IV. And it will require IV contrast, but there's no catheters going up into the heart. They use a CT scanner to take a picture of the heart. So it's similar, you know, scanner is the CT calcium score, but it requires more radiation, requires IV contrast, and most places require IV or oral beta blockers before the procedure to slow the heart rate down because the heart is moving the whole time they're taking a picture. They generally want your resting heart rate to be in the 50s or low 60s, so there's less motion artifacts. So it's a little bit more involved prepping for the test, mm-hmm. but it gives you a lot more information about the arteries. 
So you have these three coronary arteries for the most part on the outside of your heart that provide the nutrients to the heart muscle. The test will take pictures of the artery wall. So it's almost kind of like the carotid endomomedial thickness test where it'll look at the thickness of the artery wall, but it's gonna measure your total plaque volume. So how much plaque is in all the arteries? And then it'll also give you this percent atheroma volume, which is how much plaque is present in the arteries in the walls. Because most plaque actually, for most people, will positively remodel. So if you think of a garden hose, what does that mean, positively? Yeah, positively remodel. So in a garden hose, the blood is flowing you know, through the lumen, but there's the wall thickness of the garden hose. Plaque generally grows outward first, so the artery actually gets bigger, but the lumen where the blood flows stays the same size until much later in the game. Think of it as like an iceberg. You know, There's a huge iceberg, but only the tip is pointing out. Once that tip points out into the lumen, it can start obstructing flow but not until it generally gets to about 70% is that patient going to actually feel anything. So you can have this huge iceberg, and you're about to crash into, you know, your Titanic into the iceberg, but you want to look at, okay, well, how much of this plaque is actually in the arteries? The calcium score test will tell you if there's hard plaque, the calcified plaque, that clearly will actually give you all the plaque that's present, the hard and the soft. And it will break down the soft by two different densities. So is it, you know, very low density or is it low density? And it's more the low density and the very low density soft plaques that more contribute to the event. Can you do anything about it? I mean, of so course. obviously we're yeah. looking at now if we're doing the clearly, it, it does have some risks. I mean, radiation is a risk, but do the risks outweigh the benefits? Maybe. I mean, I really, I, I think we should all know at some point, even if we have a calcium score of zero, we should do a, you know, I'm, I'm curious as to what, well, I know what your thoughts are, but a secondary um, test it would likely be helpful because, of, again, you focus on early prevention. Right. We could protect people 10 to 20 years early. That'd be incredible, right? right. Um, when So let's say someone comes back. Is the scoring system the same, you know, for like zero to 100, 100 higher? How, how does the scoring system work on a clearly? And then what does someone do? Sure. So they recently released a uh, staging algorithm for it. So again, it's kind of uh, uh, similar to like how you would stage cancer, you know, you know, I think you asked me earlier, like, you know, how did I eventually kind of decide to go into parental cardiology? It would sort of be like waiting for somebody to have like stage four cancer to be like, oh, we should have started screening you 20 years ago. It's sort of the same way with atherosclerosis is that, you know, we don't frequently stage people if we just say that like you either have enough blockages that requires a stent or you don't. And here's your cholesterol medicine, your blood pressure medicine. But there's a definitely a middle zone, and that's where these tests like the Clearly can kind of help break that up, where they actually um, proposed a staging system where you know zero is a perfect score. And honestly, I've never seen a person with zero yet. So I think we're going to find a lot more subclinical atherosclerosis than we ever found before because we didn't have tests sensitive enough to pick it up. But this is not uh, the standard of care yet. People not are yet. not reckon, people are not doing you don't go to your doctor and they say, Okay, we're gonna do a clearly scan. Right. I mean they may recommend a CT angiogram. It is a that's good test. Be, I mean, for the most but, part, that's right, always right. The CT angiogram is pretty good. If you can get a CT angiogram, you know, th that will give you the soft plaque. But what clearly does differently is they use this machine learning AI algorithm mm -hmm. to actually kind of voxel by voxel look at the plaque characteristics and quantify it a little bit better than even a human reader could. Uh, because I have seen some uh, clearly scans where the human radiologist read the scan is completely normal, and then the clearly analysis shows that, well, there's some very mild plaque building up. And the calcium scan is different from the clearly scan in that it shows different things, but how is the calcium score done? The calcium scan test is a dry scan, meaning dry there's scan. no IV contrast required. It's much low dose radiation. So it's a breath hold. You you know lay down, you hold your breath for five, 10 seconds, they take a picture. And, and that's calcium, routine. That's for the routine. Most part, the They've calcium that, score right. is routine. Right. Um, mm -hmm. But the, the clearly scan is different. It's a, it's a little bit more involved. And honestly, the biggest thing is just education that one that people know it exists. I honestly didn't know it existed until probably. October, November of last year, um, and really just finding the, the imaging centers that are set up to do it is really kind Which of Which we're still working on because, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, it's not as prevalent as yeah. the... But it's coming. It's, it's coming. coming. It's coming. So what can someone do if they've got this soft plaque? So that's a good point is that, you know, the soft plaque has a couple options. The soft plaque can become hard plaque. You know, stands classically will make that soft plaque hard. 
And so this is one of the fallacies so is that statins will make the soft plaque. Do you want the soft plaque to go hard? Probably. Yeah. Okay. And so the calcifications are generally kind of a late stage finding, but it's a stabilizing factor. So like calcium isn't going anywhere. It's like bone. But if you have enough calcifications, you might get a fixed obstruction that causes that person symptoms. So they might have angina, but the hard plaques aren't the ones that are necessarily rupturing. It's the soft plaques. So if you turn a soft plaque into a hard plaque, their calcium score test is going to go up. And so if somebody's you know, repeating the calcium score test and they see their score going up, they're not necessarily getting worse. They're probably turning their soft plaque into hard plaque, but you got to kind of integrate all these other data points to know that for sure. That clearly will really show you that you turn that soft plaque into hard plaque. But you don't but, recommend doing it clearly more than once a year, right? Definitely the not. Radiation. They don't have that type of data yet because right. also it's the radiation that right. you get exposed to. So, but the other option that the soft plaque can do is that it can delipidate, you know, HDL particles can get in there, they can pull the cholesterol out, and the HDL can take it away, so the pimple shrinks down in the artery. Um, My or, daughter's obsessed yeah. with pimples right yeah. now. <laughs> She's going to be a dermatologist. <laughs> Astronaut. Yeah. Astronaut, yes. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, you can have the salt plaque, you know, stay steady, doesn't do anything, it can shrink, or it can calcify. It's kind of one of three options. And you can kind of infer what's going on by the health of the endothelium, the blood testing, you know, is there a lot of inflammation or oxidation? If there is, they're not shrinking that plaque yet. And then you can do the carotid intimal medial thickness test. Well, if the carotid intimal medial thickness test is getting better, that person's coronary artery stuff is likely getting better as well. Mm -hmm.